contrary to popular belief, I am not dead. At least, not in the typical way. I am dead inside though. I was out of action for a few weeks because it were panto season. Panto season now be over. I have slumbered, though my soul will never find rest. And I'm back at it, woohoo. So to help my poor adult brain get back into things calmly, I decided to read a book I've wanted to read for quite a long time now. And it has a bonus of not being very long. Piranesi by Susanna Clarke. Some of you may be aware that I also reviewed Clark's other novel, Jonathan Strange and Mr. Norrell, about two years ago. That video was essentially 30 minutes of me raving about how much I loved it. Whereas this video is essentially 10 minutes 37 seconds of me raving about how much I loved this. So what is this about? Um, well, like with Jonathan Strange and Mr. Norrell, there isn't really much of an obvious plot. It's about this guy who lives in a giant house filled with statues and when I say a giant house I mean giant. This house is thousands of rooms big. It is, to use a technical term, a heckin unit. The guy who lives there is called Piranesi. That isn't his name, it's just what he's called by the only other living person in the house known as The Other. The book is written as a series of journal entries detailing Piranesi's day-to-day -day activities in the house, cataloguing some of his favourite statues and reflecting on life. However, he becomes aware of another presence, someone he calls Sixteen, as they are the sixteenth person in the house. Aside from Piranesi and The Other, there are thirteen sets of bones which Piranesi counts as thirteen people. Piranesi is forced to question things. Who is Sixteen? Are they good or evil? Is 16 really going to make him mad or is he already mad? Who is the other? Is the other good or evil? And most pressing of all, just what exactly is Battersea? As I'm sure you've gathered, I really liked this book. It is a curiously written little story and goes about telling its tale in an unusual meandering way. I can understand why people might not like it, especially those who prefer their books written in a more straightforward manner. I do give credit when a book tries to do something different and against the grain, even if it doesn't always work, but I think it does here, and a lot of that is down to Susanna Clarke's very meticulous writing style. In the same way that the ostentatious, fussy style she employed in Jonathan Strange and Mr. Norrell supported the Regency backdrop and the persnickety Mr. Norrell, and to juxtapose the wilderness of fairy magic, her very careful way of crafting the journal entries in this helps the reader really get inside Piranesi's mind and understand the strange world through his perspective. I like the way he capitalises various words to show how he rates things by way of importance, the names he gives to things, the sort of innocence with which he perceives the other and the house. It plays with things like religion and magic and science and ties them all together quite neatly. And on the one hand, Piranesi treats the house like an entity, talking about how the house's kindness and how it provides for him. He honours the skeletons by giving them names, like the folded up child, the biscuit box man, and brings them offerings of food and drink and water lilies. But on the other hand, he meticulously records data, the flow of the tides, the movement of the stars and the moon. He experiments in a methodical, scientific manner. He predicts floods with insane accuracy. He understands the behaviour of the birds that dwell and nest in the house. But it all runs on a sort of internal logic and reason. We can see why he thinks the way he does and why he believes the house to be this benevolent force. And yet he thinks that the other's strange rituals, which involve candles and compass points and strange words to unlock an ancient knowledge, are a bit silly. There's no basis for it as far as he can see. I really enjoyed the mystery element. It's not a clean cut who done it or whatever it's it's not a quest leading up to a rug pull shock twist it's a natural progression of understanding forced to confront the realities of worlds bigger than ours and also things inside the things we've buried deep in the recesses of our minds information is dripped but not in a frustrating way Piranesi puts things together he actively explores and seeks to find out the truth but is understandably wary of it and has to pause the quest to try and reconcile conflicting facts in a methodical, logical manner. The description throughout is really nice. I suppose the world is a little samey, the house having the same sort of colour palette throughout with the blues and the whites of the sky and clouds and marble. It's three floors and hundreds of rooms. The bottom floor is permanently flooded, the top floor is full of clouds and there are statues everywhere of minotaurs and animals and people, gardeners, 
beekeepers, angels, Piranesi's understanding of concepts not actualized in the world, like gardens and trees and squirrels, are informed by the statues. He knows what a tree is because he has seen statues of them, but not a real tree. It's difficult to write a book in this manner anyway. They are always retrospective and often reflective, which is alright until you need an active or suspenseful sequence. It's even more difficult when it's a fantasy book. If you write a journal, you're unlikely to include things like what your house looks like, what your friends look like, what you look like. You jump straight to the event you want to describe without setting the scene because you don't need to. It's why most fantasy is from the perspective of a newcomer. If Ron Weasley had been the main character in Harry Potter, he'd be on about Quidditch and house points and babbity rabbity and the reader would be completely lost. It's also why it took so long for us to work out how the I think it was the Romans made cement or sea waterproof cement despite having the recipe. They didn't write down that you need to use salt water because it was so obvious. Like how we don't specify using sodium chloride salt when making food. People in hundreds of years time after civilization collapses and is rebuilt may be pondering why their salted caramel made with potassium chloride tastes so disgusting and deadly. But Susanna Clark manages to inform us about this world that we know nothing about through journal entries which are often not informative. How? Well, because she made the perfect character to guide us. He doesn't use the journals to chronicle his emotions, as a teenage girl might. He chronicles the world. They are his write-ups of his explorations and reflections. It's a little like the pensive that Dumbledore uses. He has too much inside his head, so he siphons it off into his journals. And it never feels forced. Things like the lists of the dead people and the explanations of the world, they feel natural for him to write with this strange, meandering thought processes. Early on, he ponders the idea of someone reading them and tentatively calls you, the person reading, the 16th person. He writes with the idea that in the back of his mind, someone may well be reading these at some point, but he does not write them purely for that reason. The journals also feel like his sort of way of conversing. There is only the other in the world and the other doesn't really talk to Piranesi often, so he's usually by himself, and the journals become an outlet for his desperation for conversation. A desperation that he's not fully aware of. Also, props to Susanna Clark for nearly making me believe one of her fictional characters is real. As I was flicking through the opening pages before the actual story starts, there were some quotes from literature that you sometimes get. One was from the magician's nephew, and the other from Lawrence Arne Sales, who was quite important in this. And I had a moment where I thought, Oh, he's real. And I googled him. And he isn't real. And I felt really silly, so... Well played, Clark. Well played. I didn't really have any issues with this. I suppose there were some questions I would have liked answered about the identity of some of the bones. We know who some of them are, probably, but... The folded up child, for instance, who is estimated to be around seven years old. No idea who she could be. It's not a massive deal, and the ending is certainly very open and vague anyway, but I don't know, I I'm clutching at straws, I really liked it. This is not a book for everyone. I imagine people who can't be doing with pretentiousness in literature might not get on with this. Then again, I would usually count myself as someone who doesn't like pretentiousness, and I enjoyed it, so... I mean, it, it's 250 pages long, and a fairly gentle read. So if it intrigues you, give it a go. If you read Jonathan Strange and Mr. Norrell and liked it, you might like this. It walks that same strange line between reality and fantasy, and the world here seems to inhabit a parallel to the fairyland that Strange and Norrell touches on. If you didn't enjoy Strange and Norrell, then you still give this a go. It's not as fussily written. It is set in the 21st century, for starters, and it's nowhere near as long. And there are no footnotes, so you might find this one a little easier to swallow. I would specifically recommend this to people who like fantasy landscapes or buildings, just for the fun architecture of the house. Also, to those people, for some cool architectural inspo, look up the... I'm going to say this wrong. Carceri d'Invenzione, or Imaginary Prisons, which are etchings by Italian artist Giovanni Battista Piranesi. Yeah, who I'm pretty sure is this Piranesi's namesake. 
Uh, they're just really cool images you might enjoy. I like them. Also to the people who enjoy the Gormagast series by Mervyn Peake, there are a lot of similarities between these two books with the distinct if quirky naming system and the meandering but methodical approach to describing the setting and the idea of a house or a building being the entire world for its inhabitant or inhabitants. But this one has the plus size of being a fraction of the length because Gormenghast is an absolute heckin' unit. And that's all for now. Goodbye. Goodbye.